For those of you who ask for it, here's our super quick SOL review part one. We're going to cover everything that we studied in our first week of our SOL review. So buckle your seatbelts because it's going to go fast. All right, so if you recognize this slide, great and wonderful. Um, I want to start off by re reminding you that um, you need to know the names of the continents, you need to know the names of the oceans, and you need to know which way is latitude and which way is longitude. So we're going to run through those real quick. So we'll start with North America, South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, the Arctic, and the Antarctic down here. Then our oceans are the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, the Arctic, and the Southern Oceans. Now remember that latitude goes across this way, longitude goes up and down this way. Our special line of latitude is the equator and that's at zero degrees. And our special lines of longitude are the one here at zero degrees and that's our prime meridian, and the one at 180 degrees is the international date line. So that is that information in a nutshell. Now then, um, here's another map that shows you all of our continents, and all of our oceans, and the equator. Next are our regions. Now these are the ones that can get a little bit confusing, so let's look at these real fast. A on the map is coastal plains. It's along the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf of Mexico. It has broad lowlands and many excellent harbors. The next one, labeled B, is the Appalachian Highlands, and it includes the um, Piedmont and goes all the way from eastern Canada down to western Alabama. The Appalachian Mountains are the oldest mountain range in North America. They're old and eroded mountains. Next on our map is C, the Canadian Shield. It wraps around the Hudson Bay in a horseshoe shape, and it has hills worn by erosion and hundreds of lakes carved by glaciers. It's one of the oldest rock formations in North America. Then we have D, the Interior Lowlands. This is located west of the Appalachian Mountains and east of the Great Lakes. Rolling flatlands and many rivers and broad river valleys and grassy hills are how we would describe the interior lowlands. Then we're looking at E, the Great Plains, located west of the interior lowlands and east of the Rocky Mountains. They're flat. It is super, super flat, but gradually increases in elevation westward closer to the mountains, which brings us to F, the Rocky Mountains located west of the Great Plains and east of the Basin and Range region. Rugged mountains that stretch from Alaska almost to Mexico, high in elevation, contains the continental divide which determines the direction that rivers flow. The next one labeled G here is the Basin and Range region. It's located west of the Rocky Mountains and east of some of the smaller mountain ranges. It is an area of varying elevations, containing isolated mountain ranges, and then Death Valley, the lowest point in North America. Then we have H, the Coastal Range. This is rugged mountains along the Pacific Coast that stretch from California all the way to Canada. This contains very fertile valleys. Alright, so that's the quick, quick, super quick review of your regions. Next we have our major rivers. Um, number one on our map here is the Pacific Ocean. It's the western border of the United States. The eastern border of the United States is the Atlantic Ocean. Remember that the Pacific Ocean was the early exploration destination, and the Atlantic Ocean served as a highway for explorers, early settlers, and later the immigrants. Then if you look at number three, up in the top left corner of your screen, you see the Columbia River, which was explored by Lewis and Clark. Number four is the Colorado River, which was explored by the Spanish. Number five is the Rio Grande. It borders um, Texas and Mexico. Then number six and number seven together. Number six is the Missouri River. Number seven is the Mississippi River. And those together were the rivers that were used to transport farm and industrial products, and they were links to ports in other parts of the world. 
Number eight is the Ohio River. This is the gateway to the west. Number nine is the St. Lawrence River, and it forms part of the northeastern border with Canada and connects the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean. Then number 10 is the Great Lakes themselves. They were large bodies of water surrounded by um, land on all sides and so large that there were inland port cities that grew up in the Midwest along the Great Lakes like Chicago. Then we have finally number 11, the Gulf of Mexico, which provided French and Spanish with exploration routes to Mexico and other parts of America. So we'll take a quick look at all those. Pause this if you need to to refresh your memory to which body of water is which. Okay, let's go through these uh, geographic um, land formations, water formations real quick. An island, a piece of land smaller than a continent that's surrounded by water. An example of this would be the Hawaiian Islands or Japan. A tributary is a river that flows into another larger river or body of water. And here's a picture of two rivers flowing into each other, one being the main river, the other being the tributary. Then we have a plateau, a large relatively flat but elevated area of land. Usually these are in the more basin and range region of our country. Then we have a peninsula, like Florida, land surrounded on three sides by by water. Next we have a plain, which is a large area of flat land like in the middle of our country, like in Kansas. Now moving on to the next unit of study that we looked at, pardon my rustling papers, is going to be our Native Americans. We have archaeology, the recovery of material evidence remaining from the past. Then we looked at Cactus Hill, which is located in Nottawa, Virginia. It's the oldest known archaeological site in North America. Artifacts here are estimated to be 18,000 years old. This is all located in Virginia, as we said, like the map over here on your screen. The red part is Nottawa, and this is the um, area of the Nottawa River is very close to this dig site. Remember that the person who studies the human behavior and culture through the recovery and analysis of artifacts is an archaeologist. They learn a whole lot from everything that's left behind. Now, our Native American tribes depended on their environment, their geography, their location, their climate for all of their needs. They used animal skins and plants for clothing. They ate the food that they could grow, gather, or hunt. And their shelters were made of resources found in their environment, such as sod, stones, skins, and wood. Our Inuit tribe lived in the Arctic where the temperatures below freezing much of the year. They hunted and fished and were that was how they survived. Um, taking a moment, let's remember what natural, human, and capital resources are. Natural resources come directly from nature, the things that you see outside around you that grow in the wild. Human resources are people that work to produce things. Capital resources are the goods that are used to make other goods and services. You have to take natural and human resources and put them together to come up with a capital resource. So the natural resources, some of the ones that the Indian, Indian tribe would have had, would have been the fishing, um, the fish in the rivers, the hunt, the animals that they were able to hunt. The human resources might have been the people who fished and hunted, the people that made clothes. And capital resources were dog sleds, spears, bows, and arrows. The Crocodile tribe lived in the Pacific Northwest coast where it was rainy and mild, and I said that wrong, it's the Crocodile tribe. They fished. They built totem poles and homes out of wood because the forests were plentiful in this area. Their natural resources were the fish and rivers and the trees. Their human resources were people that fished, the um, people that built their homes, and people that carved those totem poles. And then capital resources would be canoes, bows and arrows, spears, and totem poles. The Pueblo tribe lived in the southwest where it was hot and dry. This is modern-day Arizona area. They made their homes out of adobe and lived in the desert or on cliffs. Corn was an important food for them, and they used to irrigate the water from where they had water in the rivers all the way to where their corn was growing. Their natural resources were grass and dirt for their adobe, the cliffs, and the corn. Human resources were the people who made houses and farmed, and their capital resources were the, was the adobe for the houses, any baskets that they made, and any weapons that they made. The Lakota tribe lived in the Great Plains area where it's dry and grassy. 
They were nomadic, which means they moved around with the, with, ever, with the buffalo. They lived in teepees. They made clothes and tools from am, animals. And the main source of food was buffalo. Natural resources for these Indians would be the buffalo themselves was the main one. Human resources were the hunters and their gatherers. And capital resources were the buffalo and the teepees. The Iroquois tribe lived in the northeast Northern America area where there are heavy forests. They grew many crops, fish, and hunted small game for food, and they also lived in longhouses. Their natural resources were crops, fish in the rivers and lakes, animals to hunt, and the forest. Their human resources were hunters, fishers, and farmers, and their capital resources were the trees for making their longhouses, their bows, their arrows, their spears, and other tools. This map shows you very carefully, if you can see the outline, where each of these Indian tribes lived in the United States. Familiarize yourself with this map because it might be on your test. So take a moment, maybe pause the video and take a look at this map. And when you've done with that, we will move on to our Native American and explore interaction. Remember, we talked about areas of conflict and areas of cooperation. Their areas of conflict were their differences in opinion about land, their competition for trade, the differences in their culture. Remember, we talked about going to your house and me t um, changing how your mom makes your favorite food. Diseases were another one, and then differences in language. Those are all areas of conflict. Then we have areas of cooperation. The weapons and metal farm tools that they had Trade and crops were all areas of cooperation between the American, the Native Americans and the European explorers. These four groups of people are the ones that we deal with in North America. The Spanish, remember, conquered and enslaved Native Americans, brought Christianity, brought disease. The French established trading posts like Quebec and spread Christianity. The English established settlements, claimed land, learned farming techniques, and traded. And the American Indians throughout all this taught them farming techniques, but believed that land was to be shared and not owned. Um, our next question, which is weird on the screen here, is why did the European um, countries, um, why did they come here in the first place? What was their motivation? Looking at Spain, we have Francisco Coronado. Remember that he claimed the southwestern United States and Mexico for Spain. He dreamed of gold and riches in this area, but he never found it. Then we have the two men from France, Samuel de Champlain, who established the French settlement of Quebec, and Robert LaSalle, who claimed the Mississippi River and surrounding area for France. Remember LaSalle in the valley. Then we have England, John Cabot. He explored eastern Canada, the area that's now Newfoundland, and he, said he did all of that for England. And then we have the Portuguese, who decided to do things a little different. They took voyages of discovery to West Africa and traded manufactured goods like cloth and metal to these three kingdoms, Ghana, Mali, and Sanji, and they made them very powerful um, as they traded those manufactured goods for gold. And they also increased their interest in world resources by doing all of this. And remember that the order these West African kingdoms go in from oldest to newest is actually alphabetical. That's how you can remember it. And finally, our God, gold, and glory in forces of exploration. Those were the motivating forces. We have the religious reasons. The many countries thought that it was their duty to spread Christianity to the heathen worshipers in other parts of the world. We have our economic reasons. They were looking for riches, gold, natural resources, and trade opportunities. And then we have glory. The countries were in competition with each other, and they also wanted to prove that their culture was superior. They have our obstacles of our explorers. Remember, their maps and navigational tools were very, very bad. They had disease and starvation that they dealt with on the way over. There was the fear of the unknown and lack of adequate supplies. Accomplishments. They exchanged goods and ideas. They improved navigation in ships every time someone came over. And I don't know if you can read that one or not, but it says claimed territories. Remember, we would not be here if it weren't for those guys that did all of that exploring. 
Okay, now we're going to look at our colonies. This is another big section. And where are our colonies? They're along those eastern the eastern shore near the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Roanoke Island and Jamestown are the first two that we want to look at. Roanoke Island was an economic venture. When John White went back to England after beginning this settlement, he was going back for more supplies, and when he returned, he found that everyone was gone. And no one knows for sure what happened. It is called the Lost Colony of Roanoke Island. Then we have Jamestown, which was the first permanent settlement in North America. It was also an economic venture by, Virgin by the Virginia Company. Now, what do you mean economic venture? Well, this means a large company sponsors the colonists to live there, thinking that they would be able to send back raw materials and make that company some money. Next, we have the Plymouth Colony. This was settled by separatists from the Church of England who wanted to avoid religious persecution. One of the more famous early settlements, um, and we get the tale of the first Thanksgiving from this colony. Then we have the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Settlers um, came here because of religious reasons as well. These guys were Puritans who wanted to avoid religious persecution. John Winthrop was the man who led this colony. Then we have Pennsylvania, settled by Quakers who wanted freedom to practice their faith without interference. They were settled by the Will, um, William Penn, who was a wealthy Quaker, and he looks like the guy off of the Quaker Oats box. Then we have the Georgia Colony. This was settled by debtors who hoped that they could experience new life in the colonies. They wanted economic freedom in the new world. Now our 13 colonies, after we began all this settling, we expanded, and we have the New England, Middle, and Southern colonies. The New England colonies had the social and political life centered around their village church. They settled political things by having town meetings. Their resources were um, timber, fish, and deep harbors were their natural resources, and their human resources were skilled craftsmen, shopkeepers, and shipbuilders. They were located in the Appalachian Mountains. They had the Boston Harbor, hilly, rocky soil, and jagged coastlines, and their climate was moderate summers and cold winters. They had specializations in fishing, shipbuilding, and the naval supply industry. Our mid-Atlantic colonies were made up of villages and cities that were very diverse in lifestyle and religion. Lots of people from lots of different places came to the mid-Atlantic colonies. Their life centered around the colonial market. Their resources, their natural resources, were rich farmland and rivers. Their human resources were unskilled and skilled workers and fishermen. Their geography and climate was the Appalachian Mountains, the coastal lowlands, harbors and bays, and wide, deep rivers, and their winters were mild and their summers were moderate. Their specializations are livestock, livestock, grain, farming, and fish. And then we have our southern colonies. Their social and political life centered around the plantations. They were separated from a lot of other people. There were very few cities or former, formal schools. Their natural resources were fertile land, rivers, and harbors, and their human re resources were the farmers and enslaved African Americans. They were located, they had the Appalachian Mountains, rather, the Piedmont and good harbors and rivers in, as their geography, and their climate was humid with mild winters and hot summers. Their specializations were tobacco and cotton farming, indigo farming, and wood products. We talked about the concept of interdependence, how one area wasn't able to make absolutely everything they needed, so they depended on the other areas, the other colonies, to give them what they needed. New England depended on the South and the Mid-Atlantic for raw materials. The Mid-Atlantic traded with the South and New England for anything that they didn't make themselves. And the South depended on New England for manufactured goods and the Mid-Atlantic for grain and livestock. Now we have our social groups in colonial America. We start with our large landowners. They lived in the South and they relied on indentured servants and slaves. They were educated in some cases, but they had a rich social culture and they had a very high social status. Artisans are another one that had a high social status. They were valued for their skills as craftsmen in towns and on plantations. 
and then farmers would be next in line. They didn't have they had sort of a medium social status. They worked the land and relied on family members for labor and their life centered around their crops. Then we have indentured servants. They made a contract to work in return for passage to the new world and they were free at the end of that contract. They didn't have a very high social status. Then we have women. They were hard working um, in the homes, helping with any farming they needed to, and definitely raising children. They were called homemakers and they had little rights. And then at the bottom of our social status group is the enslaved African Americans. They were captured in Africa, sold to slave traders, and shipped to the colonies. They were owned as property for their entire lives and had little to no rights. And if they had any children, those children were born into slavery. Now that's it. I hope you got everything. We're going to have a part two video for everything else that we've studied and maybe even some stuff we didn't have time to get to. So I hope this helped you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to bring them to me and I'll do my best to answer them. See you later.